the nature of how you operate is going to change. I mean, let's say you talked about at the beginning, you know, business owners staying awake at night waiting for that last check to roll in. You know, if you think about, you know, maybe your accounts receivable averages, you know, 60 days on a normal basis. And let's say you're, you're suddenly going to see a 10% lag on your accounts receivable. Well, now you're waiting 66 days for money to come in. All right, good morning, everyone. If you're, of course, joining us uh, in the Southeast Atlanta area like we are, it's a bright and early 8 a.m. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and this morning, I have Joey Maxwell, who is Commercial Risk Advisor with Sterling Seacrest Partners. Joey, good morning. Thanks for joining me. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. So we're going to get into this thing called risk and risk management that has... Um, it, you know, doesn't even need to be uh, set up, but that word has definitely changed uh, into different meetings here in the last uh, couple of couple of months. So, tell us about Sterling Seacrest, what you do, how you found them, and started working with them. Give it, give us a little bit of background. Yeah, absolutely. So, Sterling Seacrest were um, an Atlanta-based risk management, um, insurance, uh, employee benefits, and surety bond firm. Um, so we are kind of spread out across the Southeast. We've been in business for about the past 13 years. And a lot of what we focus on is being kind of a consultative advisor from a risk management standpoint with our clients. And that can mean a number of things, right? And so you, you kind of backed into the, uh, the perfect way to segue to one of my answers to one of your questions, which is, you know, has the nature of risk changed? And in so many ways, the answer to that is yes, it has, but the, the basic, essential definition of risk, in my opinion, hasn't because as business owners and business operators, we're constantly wearing that risk management hat, whether we feel it or not, because yeah. personally, the basic definition of risk for me is the ability to maximize upside while minimizing downside. And so the nature of what we're trying to do every single day hasn't changed. Just the strategies that we're going to have to use to move forward are going to look a lot different, especially as we try and define, I guess, you know, the title of our podcast today is What's Next? Um, if I could tell you and had a crystal ball, I'd probably be <laughs> on 10, to, 10 different interviews today. But um, I wish I knew the answer to that. I'd write a book for sure. I but, wish you did too. <laughs> <laughs> um, we wouldn't be on video. That's yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I think the, you know, what's next is, is clearly going to be defined by how we operate and how our successful businesses around us all decide to move forward. And there's going to be certainly some ones that make some mistakes and make some trip ups. And we probably all make a few mistakes as we try and figure out how to navigate this. But what we're trying to do at Sterling Seacrest and me personally with a lot of my clients and prospects and friends is, you know, helping people kind of navigate the different areas of risk that we're going to try and identify. And we can talk about here today, kind of across your people, your experience, your customer experience, and then what new risks are you going to face going forward? Yeah, I love that because because you're right. I mean, this word, the word risk has always existed. You know, when you start a business, you're you need to have a product or service that sells, right? You're going to need customers. You potentially need space. Um, you're probably going to need employees, and you have to pay those employees. And there's always that risk of something's not going to happen. Something's not going to sell like you thought it would, or you're going to have trouble finding space, or uh, you know, many a business owner spends a sleepless night wondering when is that last check going to come in the mail that's going to take me over and I can cover payroll? Mm -hmm. um, and then COVID hit and it was this thing that no one really thought was going to happen, right? Like, even though, you know, okay, there's all these risks, but like in what world would I have to completely shut down my restaurant? Like there's really, right. If you're, if you're following all the rules and keeping everything clean, you don't have to do that. Right. I mean, I, I can vividly remember sitting in my office in January and seeing videos of Wuhan, China lockdown and just seemed so surreal and so foreign to me. And you're looking going, that that couldn't happen here. Two months later, the NBA shuts down and here we are and <laughs> everyone's operating from their homes. So it's it, the, you know, we thought we were the rate of change in which we were in previously was quick. And I've been telling people literally we know we were only in first gear. And a lot of what you just talked about, I think, is what people are challenged with now is because a lot of think, people, I think, have operated with this kind of risk management focus that risk management means insurance. Well, it doesn't always necessarily have to mean that. It can mean a lot more things beyond insurance because as a risk manager, 
it's not always preventing auto accidents or preventing my workers from getting injured. You know, if I came up to you and told you that, hey, you're going to have a 10 to 20 percent decline in your productivity amongst your employee base and your morale is going to decrease by 40 percent. Would you say that's a risk to your business? I'd certainly say the answer to that is yeah. yes. Yeah. So it's, it, there's a lot of metrics and trying to measure and quantify risk across your organization and how you can attack it. Yeah. So let's talk about that. When we um, when we start going back to whatever this new normal will be, what are some things that you're you're looking for and guiding uh, business owners to be able to avoid kind of in the future where, um, you know, because you set it up perfectly. It really is realizing that the risk is, exists because we're still going to have risks, um, but trying to minim minimize the hit essentially. So, so walk us through that, what you do for, for business owners. Yeah, absolutely. And so we are kind of started with defining what the problem is, right? Risk is maximizing upside while minimizing downside. And that's what risk management to us really is. So what we're trying to do after that is instead of looking at, all right, you've got risk, you've got automobiles, you've got workers on the floor, you've got product liability, whatever it may be, here's a financial product, right? That's going to help you with all your risk management needs. And we're just going to finance that away. Well, personally, and you and I've talked about this before that I personally believe insurance is the most expensive way to manage risk. And while it's necessary, as I think many people have found out through this crisis is a largely political product. And, you know, it's a, it's not always going to produce the results that I think you necessarily hope it would. So we're, we look at this through, we're going to try and break it down to, Take that hazard piece that I already talked about, right? With kind of a something that can create a physical loss to your company. But we also want to look at it through a strategic and a business lens. So strategic lens being kind of what's going to affect the larger financial picture of your company, your firm, your organization, and a business risk, what's going to affect the day-to-day -day, day operations. So we're going to work through, identify the things that are going on in your business amongst those two buckets. And then we're going to try and find ways to avoid those risks. We're going to find a way to prevent them if we can. And if we can't prevent them, we're going to find a way to mitigate them. So take something that we know where we have potential of loss and minimize it. Yeah, I love that. I, um, I kind of made this analogy the other day that because you've seen um, <clears throat> I've seen a lot of the Dave Ramsey yeah. memes going around of like, this is what I've been trying to tell everyone for years. This is why you need to have six to you know nine months saved in the bank. And I kind of thought, yeah, you know, that's why me as an individual motorist on the road, aside the fact that yes, it's required by law, I'm a good driver. I am a good driver. I'm not worried about my driving. I'm yeah. worried about everyone else's driving, which is really why I have insurance, right? Is it's mm -hmm. the it's the risk that is there, but it's unexpected. Like it, we still don't expect it. You were you were protecting against the thing that could happen, even though you think that it won't. But, you know, I think it's pr been driven home recently that actually, yeah, it really can happen. Absolutely. And so, you know, a number of things that we've even been helping a lot of my clients with is even just doing things all the way down to financial stress tests and doing five, six different scenarios through, you know, all right, take your base case of what your normal sales are during this time, cut your revenue by 25%, cut your margin by 25%. Cut your revenue by 25%, cut your margin by 50%. What does your productivity look like? How's that going to affect you? And then even looking all the way down to, you know, the nature of how you operate is going to change. I mean, let's say you talked about at the beginning, you know, business owners staying awake at night waiting for that last check to roll in. You know, if you think about, you know, maybe your accounts receivable averages, you know, 60 days on a normal basis. And let's say you're suddenly going to see a 10% lag on your accounts receivable. Well, now you're waiting 66 days. For money to come in and if you're thinking about all right i've still got this line of credit with the bank i can access that anytime well what if your covenant says that you know your line of credit is based on your account receivable and that's all factored under accounts that are under 60 days now you've got a lot of less capital to access so it's trying to look and take that lens and broaden it to see all right where are really you know what's different now than it was before and how can we operate think about even just all these firms and um a lot of the restaurants that shut down and suddenly started shifting doing delivery. A lot of them didn't necessarily have insurance coverage for delivering food. Other places. Right. I, I've got dogs running around too. Yeah. Yeah. She, um, <clears throat> apparently it's walking time. So she heard some other dogs coming down the hall. 
Yeah, my dog's outside the door. He's not thrilled that I shut him out. <laughs> uh, but I mean, you think about restaurants, even that, you know, have had to shift to delivery, like I said, you know, they didn't necessarily comprehend that in their exposure previously, or even manufacturing firms they are sorry, and you know, you know, you've got alcohol distributors manufacturing hand sanitizer now. There's, there's different risks involved entirely across from just your product delivery to what's coming through in your supply chain. Yeah. So when, when should a business come to you day one, when they open their doors, um, definitely not five years down the road when, you know, when you start seeing risks come in. Um, so, so when's the best time that they get started with, with you and kind of set up some security? No, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. Obviously I love helping businesses get started and get out the gate and working through those processes and challenges of getting a business and lifting it off the ground. But whether you've been in business for 10 days or 10 years, nothing really changes from the fact that risk management is a daily focus. So whenever, you know, the light bulb sometimes clicks, you know, I was uh, avoiding the political, but, you know, somebody mentioned to me the other day about a, a particular political candidate. It's like, I don't really trust anybody that can't change their mind over a period of time as they gather and understand new facts and situations. And so I think as business owners, we all operate the same way. And I, I hope that businesses aren't just static in the way they approach risk management their entire, you know, their entire life cycle or span, whether it's 10 years or 30 years, you know, you kind of have to have a dynamic view about it and look at it and say, all right, like maybe what I did for the last five years since I've been in business worked great for that, but it's not going to work for me very well going forward. And, you know, I, I often ask the question of a lot of my clients and prospects is, you know, is the way you're doing business today going to be the same way that you can do business five years from now? And largely the answer is normally no. Okay. So what are we going to have to change in the way we approach things? Yeah. Yeah. So what are maybe three to five kind of hot areas, if you will, that you look at when assessing what type of coverage a particular business needs? Okay. So, you know, obviously I'm going to look at the, the main piece at the beginning yeah. when we're just talking about most of the time people are approaching me and saying like, Hey, I need a quote on my insurance. And that's great. And that's about 25% of the time. My, what I spend my time on is that kind of like, Hey, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to take your insurance coverages. I'm going to place them for covering your automobiles, covering your liability, which you know, your, your liability that's generated by your business operations. But, you know, Outside of that, when we start looking at coverages, I mean, you can talk about just from a just from a pure insurance standpoint, all the way down to you can kind of design a coverage for just about anything you want from something as large as, you know, covering your workers compensation risk all the way down to uh, credit risk of covering your accounts receivable. Let's say, you know, most of your stuff is most of your sales are centered around one customer and you're worried about that customer going bankrupt. You can insure against that. Interesting. Okay. That's super insightful. I had, I hadn't, my brain hadn't really gone there, but that totally makes, makes a lot of sense. If you have uh, fewer, larger accounts. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we, we alluded to what's next. So how do you, how do you think COVID-19 has changed the risk landscape, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the biggest things I think I see is that organizations are certainly going to become leaner in the way they operate, right? I mean, if you look at, you know, kind of a, a, a bellwether for how a lot of organizations in the small to medium space operate, it usually starts in the kind of the Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 space. And you see people getting laid off, getting furloughed, salaries being cut. And those larger organizations really trying to streamline their their teams and their processes. And so I think as we try and exit this, one of the big things is we're going to be trying to do just as much or more work with less people. And I think a lot of that leads to a lot of productivity and morale burn. And so one of the biggest risks that I think I, I personally see is how do we keep employee morale and employee productivity up? And yeah. that means a lot of different things to a lot of different firms. But I think one of the biggest things I've seen that a lot of my successful clients and friends have done during this time is even though there's so much remote work, there's so much disconnection between, you know, people at this point, and hopefully, you know, one day we get back to that. I think one of the things I've seen that people do really well is, all right, how do we, how do we shout out the, the high performers in our organization and keep that strong for people just doing the little things well every day? Like, 
hey, Whitney and Joey got on a video call today. Like that's really positive and sharing that team experience. But in, along with employee morale, I think one of the biggest risks is going to be how do we go back into the office? You know, I, I think we've all learned, you know, on May 1st, we're not going to wake up and the virus is suddenly just going to wave by yeah. and be gone. That's um, so true. That's yes. If, if yeah. only wishing made it so. Um, but we're going to have to learn how to operate in this world. We're going to have to learn how to have in-person meetings again. I mean, I was uh, I had a really shocking experience the other day in the grocery store. I, uh, I came home, told my wife about it because I was going to say they would have seen my jaw dropped under my mask if I hadn't been wearing it over my face. But I watched two gentlemen shake hands and something that eight weeks ago would have seemed this, you know, totally mundane. Like, absolutely. I come and I shake someone's hand. I looked at them. I was like, what is the person have a death wish? Um, it yeah. was like shocking yeah. thing to see. And so, you know, how do we get back to work? And I think the biggest risk is going to be what is the office of the post COVID-19 outbreak mm -hmm. look like? Do you have one-way hallways? Do we have staggered shifts? What does that present for your organization? And what does that present towards productivity and actually driving outcomes for your firm or organization? Yeah, yeah, super insightful. Interesting, one-way hallways. They've done it in the grocery store. You know, yeah, I mean, that's true, that's true. And, <laughs> which is a whole other you know, thing, but, um, to, you know, which I mean, it points back to the risk, but to your point, these are all guidelines and we have to assist one another, right? It's a, it, it, when you think about it, back to my road analogy, that's true. We've got, you know, the lane goes this way and everybody in this, on this side of the road needs to be going north and then the others are going south. But yeah. I mean, it's same thing. I've experienced kind of something similar to you in, in the store where, and it's so interesting because we all seem to be so um, considerate on some things and then other things, it's like nothing's changed, right? Because even though that there are those directions um, in the grocery store, some people still aren't paying attention. No. Or, it, you know, if you're standing there and you're looking, trying to, I don't know, pick out what you want. Um, I've seen where, you know, there's two individuals and they're, it's almost like they're fighting for the shelf space. Of, well, I need to get that thing next. Yeah, but, you know, give the space and allow that person to be able to do that. So, uh, I mean, it's super insightful. It's just we all I feel like a key takeaway from from our conversation and in the COVID situation in general is be mindful of your brother and your sister. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, it's uh, it's certainly a challenging uh, concept for the American psyche to grasp up. Uh, oftentimes because I think we're focused so much as a consumer brand to to think of me, 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 me buy this, I do this kind of thing. And it's taken that, thrown it totally on its head. And we aren't necessarily trained to think in a collective of, you know, the way I operate today is going to impact somebody around me. Yeah. And we're really seeing that now of how we're all having to look at this and say, all right, we need to be rowing one direction. And the way that I operate during my day has a direct effect on the person that lives across the street from me now. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about um, the the charity campaign. Now, this is a Sterling Seacrest Partners charity campa campaign. Yes. Let's take out the virus ATL. Yes. And no. so we okay. uh, we're, we're really excited about it. We started a, a charity campaign, albeit it's small. Um, but every little bit counts towards kind of supporting our local communities. It's called Take Out the Virus ATL. And so what we're encouraging our, our friends and um, clients and prospect firms to do is we're sponsoring our employees up to $50 for one takeout meal at a local restaurant um, in their area. And we're nice. going to refund them. So they go buy their meal, send us a receipt. We're going to refund them for it. And so we're encouraging other firms in different areas to do that because, you know, like I said, albeit small, you know, we're injecting fifteen, twenty thousand dollars of our 150, 200 employees back into our local communities. And I think every restaurant owner that's around would tell you that that would be a great help as they're trying to figure out how to navigate this crisis. So we're encouraging a lot of firms to take a look at it. Um, of course, I can remember the website name off the top of my head. I believe it's takeoutthevirusatl.com, but I could be wrong on that. Hopefully. No, you're right. <laughs> Look at it right here. You're right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, we're we're hoping that, you know, whether it's $10, whether it's $15, $20, um, like I said, it's, it's, albeit small, I think it could have a great effect. And 
we'd encourage you to go to that website and we'll do what we can to, from a PR standpoint to help you when you do it, we'll publish your logo out. We're submitting things through different chambers of commerce um, and news organizations. So we're going to try and if you do a small part, we're going to try and make sure that you get some recognition for that in your local community. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Um, we, uh, as a household too, we've, that's kind of been our Friday nights, right? Like every Friday night, we, which would have been anyway, right? We're going to go wings or pizza or what have you. And we are, we're still very much trying to, to keep that tradition, if you will. Um, I mean, you know, especially if you're blessed to still have your job and still be working. Um, I enjoy stimulating the economy where I can. So I love this. I love, and that's a, you know, it's really a simple thing to do, right? You can still order online and um, you get your favorite meals and then you're really helping again back to your brother and sister, keep their job. Yeah. I love that. Absolutely. So hopefully people will do it. And uh, I know I'll be utilizing it for my Friday night Mexican pickup. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So Joey, um, if there is a business out there, how do they get in touch with you and um, tell us too what, what, what a perfect fit would be. Yeah, absolutely. So perfect fit is always a, a challenging uh, idea, but we usually at my firm, we like to say our best clients allow us to do our best work. And so, you know, I may not be the perfect fit for somebody that just wants to focus on the solely the insurance product of like, hey, I want you to you know shave 5% off of my price today. That's, that's perfectly fine. And it's a perfectly respectable thing. Um, and I can certainly try and help with that. But Largely what we're trying to do is from a broader risk perspective. So I'd stay focused on an answer of, you know, taking a holistic look at risk. There's the best people that I enjoy working with. And from a getting in touch with me standpoint, you know, give me a call, shoot me an email. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate or prudent to recite that off here or not, but um, hopefully it'll tag it somewhere in this. Yeah. It, um, give us your, your best contact if that's your email or, or your yeah. phone. Absolutely. Um, so my email is jmaxwell at sspens.com. And my phone number is 404-401-4488. Perfect. And Joey's tagged on all of our social media as well. So um, they can get in touch with you on LinkedIn and things like that too. So fantastic. Awesome. Well, Joey, this is, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. I've had a blast. I really appreciate you doing this and um Hopefully we can have a conversation in person sometime soon. Yeah. Listen, we need like, uh, so I keep saying I'm going to do like a food tour when this is all over. Like I'm picturing a big party bus and what we're going to do is like breakfast, first lunch, second lunch, third lunch, dessert, dinner. No. <laughs> Just the whole day is going to be restaurant tour. So oh, <laughs> I, know. I, to get there. I don't think I'll ever, you know, exhale when I get a wedding invitation in the mail again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm there. I'm going to be yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Everyone's like, whatever you ask me to do, I will be there when this is over for sure. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Thanks so much, Joey. Thanks. Thanks.